On May 1st, 1990, playwright Neil Simon was the guest on Later with Bob Costas. He talked about the creative process and it was eerily similar to Bob Dylan when he talks about going into being another person or not knowing where it comes from or it has to happen and it's a head dump and not controllable. Simon gives a little different version of it, but very similar. And I think a lot of creative people are afflicted this way. Simon also identifies his three favorite works, Lost in Yonkers, The Odd Couple, and uh, The Sunshine Boys. And he talks about people who played in those works and people who almost fulfilled the roles of, let's say, Felix and Oscar. Fascinating part of this interview. There is a part two, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Nights to call him prolific is like referring to Wilt Chamberlain as lanky. He's had 25 or 26 plays on Broadway, all but a tiny handful of them have been hits. At one time in 1966, he had four plays running at the same time. The Odd Couple, Star Spangled Girl, Barefoot in the Park, and uh, Sweet Charity, the Bob Fosse musical for which he wrote the book. In a recent, uh, recent New York Times Magazine article, uh, David Richards, who wrote the article, said, you're the last of the old style playwrights. Where you call the last of the red hot playwrights, using my title as a paraphrase. Um, <clears throat> I think what he meant by that was there is no one, not many, that I can think of who writes consistently for the theater uh, almost every year. I mean, I've done, actually, I've done 27 plays, two I didn't bring to New York, but um, in, in a period of 30 years. So that's doing one almost every year, which is the way I grew up. I mean, every year uh, Tennessee Williams had a play, and even before my time, George S. Kaufman and Morse Hart and all the great playwrights, that was their living, that was their life, and they did a play almost every year. And now, um, some of our really terrific playwrights, like David Mamet, um, does a play every three or four years, five years maybe, does, he's into films now. Um, it makes me sad a little bit to be even thought of as the last of the play, uh, Red Hot playwrights, not for myself, but for the future of the theater. I mean, I want an infusion of new blood coming. Are you always writing? Or is there a period of time that you set aside, or is it a constant process? I am writing as we're talking, Bob. <laughs> uh, I'm always writing, almost always. Uh, almost even on vacations, I'll take the pad with me. Um, I don't know if it's an obsession uh, or another part of me that just has to keep functioning all the time. And when I say another part, different from the part that's married, that goes on vacations, that has a, a life of its own. But I wrote in the introduction of uh, the first volume of plays I did was that I really feel divided into two different people. One is the, uh, this living human being and the other is the observer who can sit back in this conversation now and, and observe the two of us. Are there little scraps of paper or notepads that have two pages of a potential play or a screenplay in a no, drawer much, someplace? Much more. Uh, I, I never write down um, notes. I never write down a line of an overheard conversation or anything like that. I will get an idea for a play or a film sometimes and do not know if it's going to work until I sit down and write it. I want to hear how the people speak. And uh, my producer, Manny Eisenberg, says if I get to page 35, it's usually a go project. Um, I just got to page 35 on something and I stopped. Uh, I have two plays that I never produced. I have, <clears throat> excuse me, about 25, 30, maybe 50, uh, 10 pages, 15 pages. Some I go back to years later and finish them and others will stay there forever. <clears throat> the present one, uh, which is on Broadway now at the Richard Rogers Theater, Lost in Yonkers. How long did that take to write? That one's kind of a miracle to me because um, I don't know where it came from. I mean, it just suddenly popped into my head one day. But prior to doing uh, Rumors on Broadway and then I did a film, I started a play called Louis the Gangster. Louis is a, is a character in Lost in Yonkers. Yeah. And it was just about this young boy being left um, practically on the steps of his grandmother's house, uh, a rather mean, hostile grandmother. and. Uh, because the father had to go off and, and make a living down south someplace. And I wrote about 10 pages and got nowhere with it. 
having done the other things, rumors, the, uh, the film, whatever it was, uh, I picked up, I read these 10 pages and I said, I'll start all over again. I'll give him a brother and start writing. And I wrote it in three months, the, uh, that first draft. Three months is not really a, an accurate f uh, phrase, I guess, for, for saying how long it takes to do a play because you write it in three months, then you rewrite it for another three months, and then you go into rehearsal and rehearse it for four weeks and go out of town for six weeks. So in the end, it's almost a year's work. There are lots of laughs that people associate with the Neil Simon play mm -hmm. in Lost in Yonkers, but especially in the second act, it becomes much more intense on a dramatic level and the, the relationship between the daughter played by Mercedes Rule and the, the mother in this case played by Irene Worth is is what it's all about at that point. Mm -hmm. um, are, are you drawing on on your life's pain more these days? I would work? think so, yes. It happens automatically. Uh, I would think after writing so many comedies in my life and, and you start to get older you start to think of your own mortality and you think of all the people you've lost in life, of the, the friends who are gone. Um, you've seen more tragedy in your life and you see the pain that people are going through and it somehow infiltrates into your mind and into the plays. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're feeling depressed or feeling more pain at the moment, just that you have more access to that part of your personal history, you're able to tap it more? Yes, but even when I, I mean, going back uh, about 10, 12 years when I wrote Chapter 2, which was the break, well, after the death of my first wife and, uh, and I married Marsha Mason, um, I relived uh, the agony of losing my first wife. So you do go through the pain. I mean, writing it was a, a horror. Uh, and yet when I get to do the play, after a while you become disconnected to it and it becomes a play. The first reading of it, when I first heard it, it brought up all of the sorrow that I went through. After a while it becomes a play and you treat it as a play, which I think is wonderful because then you realize it's cathartic. You've dealt with the pain and gotten it out rather than keeping it in all the time. And I've received more mail probably on chapter two than any play I ever wrote because the people who wrote in were people who lost a spouse. and. For some reason, whether it's religious or uh, cultural, social, whatever, they felt it was almost a sin to go on and marry again, to live your life and be happy. There's something in chapter two that you find in, in a number of Neil Simon plays, which is early on, the tone is relatively giddy. And then there's the quick shift into the more introspective. Hmm. It's like that in Prisoner of Second Avenue, too, where the Peter Falk character loses his job but he's kvetching about it and he's yeah. all upset and that's kind of comical even though he's in pain then later on he has the nervous breakdown in chapter two there's the there's the newfound romance and the feeling that this is exhilarating but then there's the reflection and and hmm. uh, the guilt about it well you hit on uh maybe the most important uh element of my development i think as a playwright because in the beginning they were all just comedies they were it was Barefoot in the Park and, and The Art Couple and, and a few others. Um, and at some point I said, why can't you write plays the way life happens? Uh, in other words, your life is wonderful. Uh, things are terrific at home. Everything is great. And the phone rings and there's tragedy on the other end of the phone. Uh, you hate that moment when it happens. And I said, why not bring it into the theater? Well, I had been taught by other playwrights, by friends. They said, don't mix comedy with drama. Um, but I found that my plays were inevitably moving towards that and what I wanted to do was not to have it happen slowly but just suddenly pull the rug from under them. And then there's the scene in, um, in Lost in Yonkers when Mercedes Rule, who is what I, I call emotionally arrested, I don't think she's completely retarded, she's not physically uh, retarded, um, but she is asking her family um, for permission to marry, uh, ostensibly asking her mother for permission to marry this other young man who is in the same sort of situation she, uh, she is, only I, I have a feeling he's probably uh, actually retarded. And her ineffectuality in asking them leads to comedy and the audience is laughing at it and it's suddenly at the last moment she says, uh, the brother said, this guy must want something from you and she says, me, he wants me and suddenly turns into her despair and anguish and crying out for her mother's 
permission to marry, to live her own life. And so the tables turn like that in an instant. And I love it when that happens. With some of your work, it's obvious that it's directly autobiographical, like the trilogy, Brighton Beach Memoirs, Biloxi Blues, Broadway Bound. But people are always asking, what portion of the other work that might be a little less obviously connected to your life is autobiographical? <clears throat> How about Lost in Yonkers? Well, first let me go back and say, not even the trilogy is autobiographical. The, I always call them semi-autobiographical. Um, for example, in Brighton Beach Memoirs, which is a story in the play of my family and my, my mother, father, brother, myself taking in an aunt and two daughters. That's not whatever happened in my life. It was the other way around. My family broke up. My brother went to live with someone else, and I went to live with someone else. So I use the facts that may have happened and change them around to fit the needs of the play. In the case of uh, Lost in Yonkers, I keep searching myself and trying to think of what is it that inspired that play. I think it, it's about a dysfunctional family. And I've been reading more about dysfunctional families in the last five or 10 years in newspapers and columns and uh, uh, in books and, and people I speak to. And that came as an outgrowth of the play. I didn't sit down to say, I want to write about a dysfunctional family. When I said, I will leave this boy with the grandmother, and the grandmother is such a, a horrendous creature, what made her become this woman, and what effect would she have on her own children? And so all four of her own children are dysfunctional, and the two young boys who are left with her become the observer to the situation, which is what I would be in life if I were left in that situation. Is there a little bit, therefore, of you in both those boys? I think their sense of humor, uh, the way they comment on things, are the, are the way I, is the way or are the way I behave uh, and the way I write. But you have to become every single character you write for that moment. If I write one line of a character and then I'm writing the line of the 74-year-old German Jewish grandmother, I have to become her to understand how she, how she operates, how she thinks and talks, and then you become someone else. It's why maybe I am obsessive as a writer, because it takes me out of me and allows me to become that, all of these other people. If they came to you tomorrow and said, we'd like to put three Neil Simon plays in a time capsule, which three would you give them? Hmm. Well, I'd put Lost and Yonkers in. Um, I'd put the odd couple in, and the third one, I think I'd get in and <laughs> forget the other play. I don't know. Um, maybe Sunshine Boys. The odd couple is probably the most enduring because it keeps showing up in, in different forms, and it's worked on the stage, it worked on television, it worked in the movies, it works with different combinations. Yeah. The, the first two on Broadway were Art Carney and Walter Matthau. And Walter Matthau, Matthau yeah. This is perhaps unfair. Were they the best? Was the original pairing the best? Well, it's unfair because um, what I see originally is what makes me laugh at them, uh, enjoy them, and so I always think when someone else is doing it that um, this is not the way we did it, which is not to say that it may not be better. I thought Jack Lemmon was superb in the film. I mean, Jack's a great, a great actor, comedian. Uh, so as a film, I thought that was the best. It was very hard for me to watch the television version because I had nothing to do with it. They bought it. I never received any money because of a dreadful deal made by a, a former agent of mine. So I just watched that thing years later. Um, and I did like, uh, ultimately did like Tony Randall and Jack Klugman very, very much. But it was like opening your own family album and seeing other people's pictures in it. I said, no, that's not, that's not <laughs> what I wrote. Do you have a problem then, almost by definition, uh, every time one of your plays is made into a movie? Because even if you write the screenplay, as is usually the case, uh, you relinquish some control. It's not, a, it's not relinquishing 100% control, as in the case of The Odd Couple on television, but there's a director and there are going to yeah. be circumstances in a movie that are just different than those in a play. Is, is that a compromise you have difficulty with? Yes, it's a, an enormous compromise. And the only ones that really worked, uh, there were about three or four of them that I thought were, came close to the original, and only one was better than the original, which was The Sunshine Boys. I thought Walter Matthau and George Burns, especially, I mean, George made such an impact in that that I thought it was better than the, the play. You 
sure I know the funny thing that's going on today. Did you ever hear the expression, that's where it's at? Well, this is where it's at, and that's where I am. I see. Did you ever hear the expression, you don't know what the hell you're talking about? It comes right in front of the other expression. You never know what the hell you were talking about. I wasn't the one who retired. You're the one who retired because you were tired. Because you're old-fashioned. I'm still new-fashioned. I'm still in demand. I'm still hot. If this room was on fire, you wouldn't be hot. Before this thing eventually wound up with George Burns in it, just oh. about half the French Foreign Legion was talked about at one time or another, right? I mean, Bing Crosby and Bob Hope and... After the play opened, I received a, a telegram from the representative of Bob Hope and Bing Crosby saying they would give me X number of dollars to, to do this. Well, if it were 25 years before and I idolized them, you know, I still did. I mean, I, I thought they were terrific, but I thought they were wrong. They were not the Sunshine Boys that I had perceived. Um, and then the next ones uh, that came into the casting line were uh, Red Skelton and Jack Benny. And they actually did test for them. And the test is brilliant. I mean, I wish they would show them on television because they were so brilliantly funny. Um, but Jack, unfortunately, got ill and died very soon afterwards uh, after making this test. And um, uh, Red Skelton then, for whatever reasons, pulled out. And then all the casting ideas came up and uh, even Lawrence Olivier among them. And uh, we decided, Herb Ross and I decided on Walter Matthau and Ironically, Jack Benny's closest friend in the world, George Burns, came to Herb Ross's house to read for it. And uh, George had not been doing a great deal. Uh, he was 79 years old. This is like 30 years ago now. So he hadn't matured like. yet, really. <laughs> no, he was still a kid trying out. Uh, he started to read. He got into the third line. And I said, what are we reading this for? It's perfect. You pride yourself, I've read, on being pretty good when it comes to casting. And it always seems through the rearview mirror that the casting is something that anyone in the audience would have decided upon. Of course, I knew. If you asked me, I would have told you to put George Burns in. But it's not quite that simple when the thing's still on the drawing board. Well, it's not simple, in uh, certainly in films. Uh, in the play, it's different, especially nowadays. One does not really need a big star in the play. If the play works, then you go with just the best actors, which is the case in, in point with uh, Lost in Yonkers, although I think Mercedes Rule is going to be a big star. Um, but when you're dealing with films, you start, you have your A list, and you find you can't get your A list, and you go to your B list, uh, very often you do get uh, the right ones. The best situation I ever had in terms of a film is where I had the two people cast before I wrote the piece, which was The Goodbye Girl, which was an offshoot of a film I wrote called Bogart Slept Here in which Robert De Niro and Marsha Mason were going to play um, sort of an episode uh, out of Dustin Hoffman's life of when he got the, his job in, uh, in The Graduate. Um, and it didn't work out. And Mike Nichols shot the picture, and after a week, uh, the picture was just called off for whatever reason. Robert De Niro had just come off Taxi Driver. Um, he came, I think, still with, um, well, with a lot of the Taxi Driver in him, and I think he needed like a, a week or so rest. I think he's one of the best actors in the world, and I wish uh, it did, did work out. But at any rate, um, Richard and Marsha read uh, the script for the goodbye, uh, sorry, for Bogart Slept Here, and I said, this is wrong for you two, let me write something else. But let me write those characters when they first met. And so I started all over again and wrote The Goodbye Girl. Uh, every two months after I'd finish rewrites, Marsha and Richard would read it, and then we'd say, okay, it needs this, it needs that. It's, it's like working in the theater. When you're writing for the stage, does it ever cross your mind, this might make a good film, and here's how I can do the adaptation? I never do that. I never think past the play. Uh, and even when I th uh, it's finished, I start to wonder, how will I make this into a film? Because it takes place virtually in one room. Uh, Bloxy Blues was probably the easiest to open up because we had 14 different scenes. But I, I rarely think of, of what it's going to be on, on film. You think Lost in Yonkers will be a film? Oh, it is. I mean, uh, it is going to be. Columbia Pictures bought it. Um, I'm, I'm hoping they have the sense to use a lot of the people in the cast. Uh, I know I will have problems in the first act opening that up because there's a lot of exposition that takes place in that apartment and a lot of major scenes that take place in that apartment. And that's where I'll have to get 
together with a really good um, director who knows how to do that. Just days after this taping, Neil Simon finally won the Pulitzer Prize in drama for his play Lost in Yonkers. We congratulate Neil and we welcome him back tomorrow night for Chapter 2, when we'll talk some more about the Broadway stage, his movies, and his early days in television. Until then, see you later. Thanks for watching Cleveland Live Music. If you like what you see, hit the subscribe button. Use Patreon and GoFundMe information as well.